Coming up on the Civil Discourse, NBC News correspondent, host of the MSNBC News show Velshi, and longtime field journalist Ali Velshi explores the role of journalists to report with integrity and hold power to account, particularly during the COVID-19 global pandemic and in the context of social protest. We've got to have civil discourse, as this is called. We've got to have people say, hold on a second. We can debate whether or not the police should have been shooting at journalists or whether or not these protests were rowdy or violent or whatever the case is. But at some point, we have to have some shared experience, right? We have to agree that the facts are the facts. Hello and welcome to The Civil Discourse. I'm Paula Morantz Cohen, Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University, speaking to you during the COVID-19 global pandemic from my apartment in Center City, Philadelphia. Today, my guest is the reporter, commentator, and anchor, Ali Velshi. Mr. Velshi has had wide-ranging experience as a journalist and now hosts Velshi on MSNBC. Well, Ali Velshi, welcome to the Civil Discourse. Thank you, good to be here. So you have an eclectic background to say the least. You were born in Kenya, raised in Toronto, Canada. You are of Indian descent and Muslim religious affiliation. So this is quite a varied set of variables. And I wonder how that, how if you could summarize, that has affected your view of the world and your reporting uh, perspective? Uh, you know, I, until three and a half or four years ago, it was a really good thing. I was a citizen of the world. I was a, I was a globalist. I thought it was a good thing. That's suddenly become a weird uh, <laughs> derogatory thing these days. But no, I am. I have a, 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 a really good, I think, worldview. I've been in the United States for about 20 years, and I enjoy it for what it is. There's a certain... Uh, beauty about this place and its its values that you can enjoy being from outside of it. So I, I've been able to be critical of things that go on here that I report about. And I've been able to embrace certain things in a way uh, that you have the privilege of doing when you're not from here. Now, part of it is being from Canada, it's not that different. Um, it's different enough, and every Canadian can tell you how it's different, but you understand culturally largely what's going on, and you understand what the differences are. So I think that has been helpful. I've always uh, said that I, I like our healthcare system in Canada, and why don't you try that out here in the United States? I've also mentioned how we don't have as many guns, and, and I, I get it. I get that it's an amendment in the Constitution, but we have a society that works without that kind of stuff. And in this day and age, what we're seeing is how other countries that are culturally similar to the United States um, maybe have a bit of an easier time with uh, income inequality or social inequality or economic inequality like we're experiencing now. So I think it informs my reporting because it opens me up to the idea that there are solutions to these things that we're going through all over the world. Some are hyper-specific to the United States, but it, it, it allows my worldview to influence how I analyze things were going through yeah. me. I think audiences realize that. Now, I want to get to your recent experience in Minneapolis and in New York City. You were hit by a, you were a rubber bullet, a police yep. bullet um, in Minneapolis, and uh, you were there when a reporter was arrested. Um, I, I wonder about the experience of being inside the fray as a reporter. Um, I know that you have been at other sites where there have been things going on, but this is a particularly fraught moment. Yeah. And can you tell us about what that felt like and how that affected your reporting? Well, the, uh, the, the proximate matter, which was being hit by a rubber bullet, felt like kicking a hockey puck to the shin. Uh, yeah. it, it's still a little bruised, but there was no particular damage. However, as you know, there were in excess of 200 instances in the last couple of weeks where journalists have uh, come into some conflict with law enforcement. Somebody lost an eye out of the whole thing. Uh, yeah. Other people were arrested. So it's remarkable to me that this happens in the United States. So let me just tell you, I have a kit just a few feet away from me that I now go with when I cover a protest in the United States. And it's got a, a hardened helmet and it's got a gas mask. Um, and I've got extra gas filters, and I wore, when I was in Minneapolis, a, a, a ballistic vest. 
States. I've never ever used it in the United States. So that's issue number one, that that's never happened. The second issue is the degree to which um, the, the conflict, if there has been conflict or danger in the United States, has not typically been with authorities, or at least not since the 1960s. So in my working life, it's brand new. So putting aside the, the, the demonstrations and the underlying social issues and the issue that, that, that African Americans and people of color have with police, the challenge to the First Amendment of the Constitution, the challenge to holding power to account, I have never encountered in the United States. And I, I, I tend to remind people that we have two roles as journalists. We, we hold power to account and we bear witness, meaning just tell people what's going on. If you cannot bear witness, you cannot hold people to account. If you can't get the video in the first place, if you're not allowed to be there, if you're being intimidated by the police, if you're being arrested, if you're being shot at, you can't do the second part, which is holding power to account. And that is a serious, serious matter that Americans of all political stripes and backgrounds should take very seriously. And as somebody who's not from here, it is really important. That is a part of the American experience that is really, really important. The, the protection of, of media rights, the freedom of the press, the ability to hold power to account. And when that starts to erode, that is something that should concern all of us. So I want to address, take that apart a little bit. The idea of the media as, you know, the, the fourth estate. Um, but the problem, of course, is that the uh, journalism now is bifurcated, right? We have two notions of the truth. And um, you've written on fake news. No. And there is a degree to which each side accuses the other of being false. Yes. And this to me is, the, is at the root of the crisis. This is at the core. When the other feels that the other is fabricating reality, then the notion of bearing witness becomes very problematic. How, how do you address that? Uh, you have to bear witness more, right? So yeah. I, I, there's stuff going around on social media about how I didn't see any protests and I probably wasn't hit by a bullet and all that kind of stuff. It's on camera. It was actually captured on right. camera. Uh, but that's what we're about now. We doubt everything that someone says if you don't perceive that they're from, uh, that they, they don't conform to your, your worldview or your political view. I yeah. think when we think about uh, freedom of the press and we think about bearing witness and we think about holding power to account, we've got to have civil discourse, as this is called. We've got to have people say, hold on a second. We can debate whether or not the police should have been shooting at journalists or whether or not these protests were rowdy or violent or whatever the case is. But at some point, we have to have some shared experience, right? We have to agree that the facts are the facts. And it's not that anybody said the video that you posted is wrong or, or it's been altered or it's been something has been done with it. They simply just don't believe it because it's coming from me and I'm coming from MSNBC. And if you, you, know, if you have a certain view of uh, politics of the world, that's illegitimate. And so that's what our problem is, that we're, we're, being, we're, not being, we're not even being self-serving. If you just choose to ignore some news, that is not to your benefit. That is to your detriment. So I don't know how we fix that problem. I've spoken on it a few times. And I'm, I guess my only hope is that for the newer generation that is going through school, we can, uh, we can imbue them with those values of understanding how to consume news, how to triangulate information, meaning if you see a piece of news about something, check other sources and see whether it's there. Maybe we can create a new generation of consumers of information. I mm -hmm. don't know how you fix it for an older generation, yeah. not digitally native. Because and even for, e even for the newer generation, the tendency to reinforce through algorithms and so forth, what you already think sure. is built into social media. And I was gonna ask you about how you feel social media and more mainstream media, and I guess MSNBC would be called that, or, and so would Fox News, yeah. um, how you see that configuration. Yeah, um, the echo chambers are not helpful, right? Uh, and, and with social media, it's not an accident. They knew in their design, and, and uh, uh, Roger McNamee writes, writes about this in his book, Zucked, uh, they knew in their design that people will engage more with things that are salacious or uh, sensationalistic. And initially that was just, uh, you know, the idea that you'd put headlines on that were maybe not misleading, but not really true, but people would click on them. 
Right. Then they realized that people actually engaged in nonsense. They actually engaged in lies. And, and, and if they can make that lie suit your worldview, uh, then, then you'll engage with it and you'll spread it and you'll do that. So I think we're all echo chambers and I, I really want to not do that. I want to, I want to get away from that in my life and my career. But social media uh, really, really underscores that. It looks like news and things look like news reports and the average person has no way to discern whether they're they're true or not. And there's nothing out there that allows you to discern uh, in a meaningful way. There's no app that you can overlay and say, is this true or is this not true? And then major news organizations get labeled as being fake news. So this is the problem of our time. We've got actual social issues like income inequality, like social inequality, uh, like economic inequality that we need to solve. But really the issue is nobody knows who to believe. And, and how you're supposed to do this. And we don't engage enough in these kinds of things where you know, people can take half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour and listen to real conversation. Where are we on listening to actual different views? Because maybe I should hear somebody else's political view on something. I can't get there if I just think they're lying or they just think oh, I'm- Ali, Ali, would you go on Fox News? Uh, I think the short answer is probably yes, yeah. Uh, I think be invited, of course, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I would. I, I think that there's an audience that doesn't hear from me and doesn't uh, necessarily get the perspective I bring. It's incumbent upon me to hear and listen and understand the perspective of others. They might be misinformed, and maybe my viewers are too, uh, but that doesn't would invalidate you, would you, people's Would viewers. you ask Tucker Carlson to be on your show? I'm not sure about that. That's a little. That's a little more complicated. Well, I, 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 again, I wonder I, about but, that because he has I, a huge audience. So I invite people with with different political views to those that my uh, audience holds quite regularly. I invite Kevin Hassett from the White House, who is the president's chief economic advisor. I, I don't tend to invite people who I've seen examples of uh, actually misrepresenting information. That I think is dangerous, and I I don't know that uh, that we need to provide extra forums for that. What I what I would engage Tucker in a conversation with is about something on which he holds a, an opinion that's different from that that my viewers would, would hold, a real debate. Uh, but but a amplifying dishonest voices is something I don't want to get in, a, engaged in. If, if it's honest voices with a different opinion, I think that's a great value. That is okay. what I call civil discourse, right? That's what we should be doing. You've got to stop listening to just people who, who you believe or you who side with you. So that's a tricky question, but it's a good one. Well, I want to shift to the fact that you've had this extraordinary experience in the fray, so to speak. Um, you were on location in Pakistan after the killing of Benazir Bhutto. You were at hurricane sites all over when serious damage was done. Of course, you were in Minneapolis and New York City during the protest after the killing of George Floyd. I wonder, do you consciously put yourself in the fray, in harm's way to some extent? Is that something that as a journalist, you thrive on? Uh, I thrive on being in the folds of the unfolding of history, right? That's I, I, the places I've gone to. I was in Iran when the nuclear deal was being done. I was in Greece when you know, the economy was coming apart. That's what I do. I, I, I feel that when news and things are, when, the, when history is unfolding, my job is to bear witness uh, or our job as journalists is to bear witness. So I throw myself into those things. And I will tell you, I do a lot of hurricanes, but hurricanes, it's very easy to control what's happening. You know exactly where the wind is coming from and you know exactly what you can hide behind and we're pretty safe about that. Getting hit by rubber bullets by police is not something you anticipate. So yeah. a, a hurricane, I, I do hurricanes all the time because you get a lot of points for it. People think you're really brave when in <laughs> fact, well, it's really just mathematics and a little meteorology. The wind's going to come from that way. And then once the eye goes over you, the wind is going to change. So you, the wall needs to be on the other side of you. It's that simple. Um, so I, I, I like to be there to bear witness to history. I think that that's the part of journalism that is under, it's under respected. The idea that if people don't tell you something is happening, you may not know. And in this remarkably self-selective world where you've got all these feeds about all the things you like, you just may not know something is happening. And so that's where I like to be. Well, that's really interesting because it used to be that that was this, what you know journalists aspired right. to, investigative journalists in the midst of things. But I think it's interesting that you're an anchor now. And you know, when we think about an anchor, we think of a talking head, somebody yeah. you know, safely in the studio. But I guess you refuse to hold to that 
Yeah. To limit yourself to that. I love that because I can book the smartest people in the world and have great debates <laughs> and discussions. So I, I do really, really enjoy that part of my job, but I'm fundamentally a reporter. Um, and there's a, a good reason for that. It's not just that I like doing that and that I think that's important about journalism, but my show will deal with all of these social and economic issues that we're dealing with right now. So it was meaningful to spend 10 days out in the streets of America with the people who were actually protesting, asking them what success looks like. What is the change they want to see? Um, you know, what does this mean when you have a sign that says abolish the police? Do you actually mean abolish the police or do you mean redirect funds? It, it's it's useful to sometimes just talk to people in an unvarnished fashion, as opposed to the people who I normally interview who are academics and PhDs and authors and activists and all sorts of things. But sometimes the best stories are just from people who are feeling it in the moment. Yeah, and I want to commend you because I do think there is a tendency in news now, and this would be true, whatever the ideology, to recycle the same right. story and without going into, you know, getting uh, uh, other and, and really textured and real yeah. components to it. Um, you covered the 2007-8 financial crisis, and uh, you've written several books about money. So that's kind of a surprising piece to your background. Yeah. Um, and I guess you started in, in financial journalism, am I right? I did. And actually, that's what led to the hurricanes, because I was covering oil closures in the Gulf of Mexico to explain to viewers why the price of oil goes up when a hurricane comes to the Gulf of Mexico. So that got me into hurricanes, which got me into sort of hazardous types of reporting, which took me into where I am now. But it's full circle, because uh, a lot of the things we deal with today, the social justice issues, the economic justice issues are economic, right? They're, they're at their heart. If everybody had all the money they wanted, they'd be less concerned about a whole bunch of things that they face in, in life. So it is full circle, but yeah, I am an economics journalist. Well, I was gonna ask you, I mean, we talk about systemic racism and then we have to talk about capitalism, right? And at some level, uh, a lot of the issues that are surrounding yes. this, as well as other things have to do, I mean, when you talked about social media and the problem of clicks, of course, it's about making money. Correct. My first speech, when I did a talk on fake news, it was all about economics. In fact, yeah. I, I mused in that speech in 2015, what happens if this doesn't become about economics? What happens if this ultimately uh, becomes about political control or ideological control? Naive me, uh, <laughs> the way already. But, but you're absolutely right. You know, economics to me was the story of the human condition. Yeah. Right? Prosperity is the story of history. When we look at charts about progress and things like that, it's about prosperity. Um, to some degree, some of the things we deal with today, the nativism and the populism and these, these uh, movements that we see around the world, it's about prosperity. The, the alt-right have been told that someone is taking your space in a university, someone took your job, someone, I don't know what, but they've, they've sort of taken things that have been imposed upon us by this global trade uh, regime uh, that has not been entirely fair to working class people. And they've turned it into, hey, don't don't be mad at the politicians and the people who made these trade deals, be mad at each other. And, and it, it's it, they've done it all over the world. And, and it would be good for people to understand that the other's not your enemy. The, the These people around you, these silly arguments that we're all having, that's not what it is. We need policymakers to make policies that actually protect working people. So do you think that we're entering a new paradigm after COVID and after these protests and this acknowledgement of systemic racism that will change, have an, a really uh, deep ch effect on our economic system or will it be, will we go back to business as usual in your- I, I think there will be changes uh, and I'll tell you why. I think people like me who are capitalists, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I used to do a show from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I, I'm a capitalist. Have had to acknowledge that capitalism is broken in the same way that uh, the plumbing uh, broke in my house a few months ago. I didn't become anti-plumbing. I didn't decide I was going to do without water. I called a plumber and we fixed it. That's what we have to do for capitalism. We have to acknowledge that it's broken. And then we have to figure capitalism, like plumbing, is a method by which we should be able to distribute uh, wealth and encourage wealth to be created. The distribution mechanism is broken. Uh, and it's broken everywhere in the world. And this is where we can fix it. So I, I do actually believe that right thinking people have looked at this and said, hey, there's a whole lot of people unemployed right now through no doing of their own. 
Um, hey, why are we having them quit their jobs and apply for unemployment insurance and do this and do that when in fact we can use these European systems where we pay these companies to keep them on payroll, which we've by the way done with the airlines right now or with these PPP grants. I think we're starting to think about things we never thought about before as being acceptable. We thought about them as radical and outside things like universal basic income. I come from Canada. Universal health care, it's not radical. Conservatives in, in Canada support it. Conservatives in the UK support it, it's not radical. It actually means you pay less money to get a better outcome. So I think we are in a space to have those discussions right now. I'm a little worried that we're a hyper-polarized society, so some people don't wanna listen, but I think we're in a space where reasonable people are saying, there might be a better way to do this. Okay, I, I agree with you. Um, so I wanna switch to something a little more whimsical. You have a cultish media profile, um, you've been referenced on many shows. You were famously dubbed the hairless prophet of doom on The Daily Show by Jon Stewart. You've been mocked uh, affectionately on Colbert. You've appeared on Oprah, The View, Oliver Stone's Wall Street, and a voiceover in a segment of Homeland, which I watched, but I didn't catch that. I have to go back. So how do you account for this media ubiquity and popularity, so to speak? Um, uh, you know, I asked a guy the other day at an event, uh, I, I meet him every year and I, he's in his nineties and I said, how do you, what's the secret? And he said, being born a long time ago, the secret for media ubiquity with me is I've been at it for a long time. Um, I, I, I and I, I'm probably at the older end of uh, media people who engage on social media as much as I do. Mm. Uh, I was sort of at the front end of it. So I think there's a sense with my viewers, there's a sense of intimacy. There's a sense that there is a connection. I'm not the removed guy who's in the TV box. I, I live in and amongst the community that I, I, I report on. So I think that's helped. I think it, it allows people on those other shows, the satire shows, to sort of use a clip of me because um, because I'm, I'm accessible or I'm approachable. And I think that's probably the, the secret. And the, the Homeland thing, by the way, is in the opening sequence. So it's very uh, easy to miss. I miss it uh, all the time. My wife recognized my voice. That's what it was. I'll have to go back and look. But I also think it's because you're likable, if you don't oh, mind my putting a little editorializing in here. Thanks. I think it's interesting that you majored in religious studies uh, oh, at correct. Queen's University in Ontario. Uh, what led you to from from religious studies to journalism and I guess to financial journalism? Yeah, so I, I was never interested in studying religion. Uh, I got to Queen's University and uh, a, a friend of mine who I'd known from outside stuff was just entering law school at the time. She had finished her undergraduate degree and she had done a degree in religion. And I asked her why. And she said, uh, because if you're going to go to law school, it doesn't matter. So why don't you enjoy your undergraduate as much as you can? And religion was such a small part of the, the university I went to that you couldn't complete your requirements within the department. You had to take uh, courses in English and in uh, history and things like that. So it was the most interdisciplinary liberal arts education I could get. And that's why I did it. And I'd written for the school paper for a few years. And so I thought maybe journalism is interesting. My parents didn't love that idea when I... <laughs> I wanted to do, do become a lawyer. Yeah, that I, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, you know, lawyer, accountant, engineer, something where there's a job and they know what that path is. Journalism is a little bit like, how does that work? How you know? He was a little. My dad was a little worried about that, but it turned out okay. He's still a little worried, but he's mostly okay. Well, you started in financial journalism, so that yeah, probably gave a certain amount of stability there. So we're nearing the end of this interview, which has been a pleasure. I wonder, you know, this is kind of a Barbara Walters question at the end here. Looking back on history, is there a vet, an event that you would have liked to have covered? Well, you know, my family comes from South Africa, and I, uh, I was too young to have been involved in the coverage of that, but I, I definitely would have liked to have covered the end of the apartheid regime, the way it came to an end. When I say the end of it, there were there were decades really of uh, of things of protest. To me, it remains the model of how uh, a country can overcome injustice and and set itself on a on a path to success. And people look at it now and say, "Well, would you actually call South Africa a success?" And I say, "Well, it's democracy. It's it's actually uh, run by by its citizens." And let's give it some time because democracies take a long time to get it right, including this one that we're living in right now. So I, I, I love that idea. I would have loved to cover movements that really result in material change for people for the better in the long term. And I actually think that I'm doing that in America right now. 
I think are. we're in the midst of. We're in the midst of a movement that will change us for the better in the long term. And as pessimistic as one can be on a daily basis, I'm actually optimistic that people go out there and they take to the streets. Protest is what this country was built on. Protest is what so much of democracy is built on. And we're, we're building. We're not finished building here. Well, it's, it's very inspiring and uplifting to hear you say that. I mean, I haven't heard very many optimistic expressions of what it is that's going on, but I, I do feel hearing you, I feel better. And I appreciate that. I think that's part of your popularity is people need hope and yeah. they need to feel that there are ways to heal and to solve the, the, the problems in this country, which are major, but yeah. the, the hope and the, um, the nobility that's built into this country is also great. That's correct. We, we can change this, and I am hopeful that we will change this. I want to thank you, Ali Velshi, for being here with us today on The Civil Discourse, and I hope you will come to our university and speak. Um, I love that. I would love that. I am always in the neighborhood, so uh, consider this my accepting that invitation, and we will make it happen. Thank you, and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you.